Hi, hey everybody. Jennifer Faust here coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us in our webinar Wednesday series. And in this year, 2022, we are covering the FAR supplements on Wednesdays at 12 o'clock. Uh, we have uh, guest speakers who have put together presentations for us. And uh, just as an FYI, we now have over 500 complimentary webinars on our YouTube channel. Uh, sponsorships are available. And you probably found out about today's webinar through our newsletter, which now reaches 23,000 federal contractors. We've got advertising and sponsorship opportunities available. Uh, a quick blurb about us. We're based in downtown DC and provide professional service for established government contractors. This includes product service and software firms. And we primarily help them with GSA schedules. Other services are listed here on the screen. You can find more out about us on our website under the About Us section. Uh, as a quick announcement, we are hosting a in-person live networking event. This is face-to-face, -face, shaking hands, exchanging business cards. Uh, so we'll be, we will be back at the Kennedy Center Monday, March 28th. It's two hours of networking. Sponsorships are available. Uh, we are expecting a good turnout there. Uh, you've got the registration link in the slides. The slides will be sent out today, uh, later this afternoon, once the presentation is over. Uh, we also want to bring your attention to another complimentary webinar happening Thursday, March 17th. It's uh, part of our COVID contracting webinar series. Uh, we're talking about what federal contractors need to know about the most recent mandate. The registration link is in the lower left. Again, you'll get the slides later today. Uh, as we mentioned, the supplements are happening on Wednesdays, 12 o'clock complimentary and recorded. Here's the full schedule. Obviously, today we're covering DISA. Uh, you can see that this series runs through the end of August. The link to register on our website under either the uh, the playbook series or uh, the FAR supplement series. And then on Fridays, we've got the corresponding playbook. So this Friday, we'll be talking about doing business with DISA. This will be talking about um, opportunities for bidding, uh, contracting trends, mergers, and acquisitions within the top contractors at DISA. Uh, and again, we uh, these correspond to the Wednesday series. And a quick thank thank you to our sponsors. First and foremost, the Virginia PTAC, that's the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. They cover the entire state of Virginia, and they provide one-on-one -on -one counseling, training, and mentorship for uh, small businesses who are just starting out in federal contracting, uh, or those that are just still kind of scratching their head and considering federal contracting. We also want to thank the Federal Business Council. Uh, they put on a lot of events, both in person and virtual, uh, at government agencies. And uh, also, they've got a big event that they host typically at the convention center every year. You can visit them at fbcinc.com or contact David Powell at david at fbcinc.com. Okay, so uh, we know that today is uh, February 23rd. We're covering uh, DISA. Uh, Defense Information Systems Agency. Our speaker today is good friend David Dempsey. He's with Dempsey Law. You've got his contact information here. I'm going to be quiet and let uh, David kick things off. So, David. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate it. And I thank you all for joining this afternoon. As you can see from this agenda, what I am going to try to do is relate the uh, background of DISA, the DISA market and their regulations and acquisition vehicles all into one cogent presentation that will, I hope, give you some information um, on DISA opportunities as well as uh, some uh, suggestions without making them suggestions on uh, drafting proposals and otherwise dealing uh, with this. So when we go to the next slide, you'll see that is uh, the background the DCA or Defense Communications Agency was a forerunner to DISA. Uh, what I want to emphasize there is that this agency has been around a long time. It is it's not just some pop-up, uh, which means it's going to have a, a lot of uh, veterans in it, at least that's my observation, uh, which identify with, with their mission. And I uh, 
mention that because when personnel identify with their mission, they're usually they're usually pretty good. They'll they'll talk to you because they'll believe that uh, they're doing the right thing for their mission, and of course, I've set that forth right there. This mission that just comes off somewhere on their website. And then uh, the disorganization uh, and the JFH or uh, Joint Headquarters for DODEN, uh, the DOD Information Network, are two parts of the same coin, and they work together. Uh, they and they work principally in this area at the uh, Fort Meade where NSA is. So a lot of their personnel are at Fort Meade or somewhat scattered around the national <clears throat> uh, capital region. And then the others are all over the place. And then note the uh, 10 combatant commands, and I've given some examples there. The reason I emphasize that is because their mission is uh, right up above provide direct support to uh, joint war, war fund. Again, emphasizing their desire, at least uh, on paper and in my experience with uh, dealing with, with this. So when we get to the next slide, what I've take, done here is gone to their, their fact sheet, and there's the site for it, and there's 34 programs that they identify on that fact sheet, although I, I have to tell you, from what I can tell, a couple of the uh, so-called programs have, have merged together. Uh, but it doesn't take much to figure out whether or not these uh, particular <clears throat> missions they have or programs are, are for uh, their, their uh, basic combat support mission. And when we get down to Thunderdome, which is their most recent one, uh, in fact, I believe Booz Allen just got a $165 million contract to start to start that up. Uh, you can see the, the zero trust objective is a different architecture for cybersecurity, and, and that is a big, uh, big deal. It's a big deal to everybody, but particularly the Defense Department, since. Uh, Chinese apparently know their way around our system better than we do. Uh, this will go up to some extent uh, to helping that. And then on the, the next slide, I just sum up the, the background and the history with uh, these four um, items. The DOD Information Network or DOD is uh, what they try to focus on. Is what they do focus on. So this is focused on it, and what Ditko uh, focuses on. And they have classified and uncom unclassified work, and that's going to be the Nipper Net and the Zipper Net. And I'm mentioning this because it all goes into the Defense Information Systems Network or DISM, uh, and that's the information network of backbone. So what I wanted to do with with these person with these initial slides is explain how these how this agency has been around for a long time with a specific mission and since they have a specific mission they have specific ways of uh, doing things which is uh, near as I can tell as I mentioned before they're, they're trying to find the best way to get the uh, best service to their to their <clears throat> combat now on the, on the next slide is when I get into uh, the market and DITCO, which is the Defense Information Technology Contracting Office, which has two main offices, uh, one in uh, Scott Air Force Base, another one in the National Capital Region. Uh, I identified one of their one of two, uh, uh, excuse me, web, web links I'm going to get to, but this is their procurement forecast. Now, every agency has to put out a procurement forecast. Uh, but this is, seems to be a little better. Uh, and I've given you some links so you can see 
how that is. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But here's the way disappears. If you look down at the bottom, you see they have 19.9 billion available for FY 2021, and it's broken out into appropriations and the Defense Working Capital Fund. The appropriations is 25% of that, and uh, in this this year, their estimate is that the Working Capital Fund is going to be 75% of that 9.9 million. And keep in mind that that's a uh, a budget estimate uh, from this uh, based on on their experience and their canvassing the agencies uh, that they're going to purchase for principally defense agencies. Uh, the the point being that the firmer, which I have in the first small bullet, which is the financial management regulation, <laughs> is uh, whether dislikes it or not is a, is a, it's going to be an element that they have to pay attention to uh, in certain requirements disavow excuse me the, the dod firmer is about the longest set of volume that i know of in the, in the defense department it is uh, eight or nine multi-hundred pages in each one it takes a long time to work with that and I use it against GSA and the Army one time it worked out pretty well because the Army wasn't doing things correctly through the through this uh, schedule by the one. And then there's this DISA instruction. That's what the I means under with 600-30-04, and that's how this is going to do the uh, working capital fund. Again, it's uh, something to keep in mind when you're marketing these this, these companies, excuse me, these agencies that they buy for, because those agencies they buy for, the money is coming from the agency. It's not coming from DISA unless unless they show you, excuse me, unless they specifically say that. And in their forecast, they will identify who the customer is. And I use, for example, the, uh, the three business areas that DISA is authorized to use working capital funds and computing services, telecommunications, and enterprise-wide services pretty much says it all for, for what they do. And then computing services, I'm just trying to give that uh, example to you because that is a, a huge amount of IT stuff. Uh, and I don't think this is accurate. I think it's a little higher than what they, they've got here. Uh, but just the data centers itself would be uh, a, a difficult, <clears throat> excuse me, an extensive and uh, presumably difficult uh, task uh, year in and year out to handle. Uh, well, I also mentioned the contracting fee. It's just like GSA's contracting fee. And I, I mentioned that because that's what the agencies, when they're working under the um, working capital fund, uh, they got to keep in mind because their budget is going to pay for 2.25% uh, of whatever services. That, that's an add on to them. So if you can afford it, your proposal would say, uh, here's our cost, here's our proposal, and then at the very end it says minus 2.25%. That uh, figure just changed. It was 2.5%, not a quarter percent. Again, uh, for large scale marketing efforts, if you look at the next slide, you get an idea on what this buys in terms of NAICS codes. And then on, and on the right side, you this is uh, 2020 data. Uh, you can see how many contracts, percentage, et cetera, and the total dollars. And you get up to a, uh, a useful, uh, useful uh, overview of where you may want to uh, focus uh, your efforts on. Okay, then we go on real quickly to an emphasis uh, on the next slide. 
to small businesses in October 2021 small business data. And I, I mentioned earlier that I thought the this is small business office was uh, pretty good. And I started to form this opinion when I was looking at this. Um, you've got the FY22 goals, FY21 performance. And when you look at those uh, breakouts and the dollar value that is uh, being expended uh, for each <clears throat> uh, class of uh, contract, it's pretty good, pretty good market. If you're selling what was on the previous slide, now you can then look at this, these prior years, um, they, this is just small businesses only, not, not the breakout of SDBs and women owned, et cetera. Uh, but they're, we're meeting pretty well uh, their goals, except for one year, FY20, and there's no explanation why or that. But the point is, this small business office is, is paying attention and keeping records on how they're doing. Uh, to a lot more detail than, than is required just with the uh, uh, the statutory goals, you know, 23% for uh, small business, et cetera. Uh, so that means that these guys, these small business people, wherever they're located, they may be able to help you um, get started either with direct sales or uh, subcontracting. So on the next slide, this is what these uh, websites, these web links and the forecasts will tell you. Uh, the requiring agency, uh, the contracting office, uh, a pretty useful description and then slash snakes code of what they're doing. The incumbent on contract because a lot of these will be IEIQ contracts that have already been awarded, but they now giving you forecasts on how much they plan to buy on a task order basis under that IDIQ. And then uh, they also list the anticipated or actual facility clearance that you're going to need. And they, they only list three levels there. It is none, secret, and top secret. So when we go to the next slide, what I've done is take these uh, links and it's and been able to uh, do these numbers here. And you can see that anybody working with uh, DISA or its customers, customers, you know, being the mill uh, it's almost for sure going to need a secret facility, secret level facility clearance. Of course, uh, you get that by uh, getting sponsored by the government or by a prime contractor or from somebody else who who has a need to work with you with your company in their in their proposal. Uh, so they'll uh, go ahead and, and sponsor you. And the takes time to do that. Um, so you know, keep that in mind if you're, if you're not already uh, cleared at, at some level. And if you can, uh, try to get a, a top secret clearance because that, that makes you good for the secret clearance. Okay, now these next three slides, uh, these are what, according to this, are their so-called premier contracts. And this is from February 2020 data. And the GSMO is the first one they mentioned, and, and this is not in an order that's particularly uh, relevant, it's just their premier contracts. Now in their bluff, or their bottom line up front, they explain what GSMO is about. And then immediately you see uh, this and, and uh, if you went down to it more, you would, you would see you know, the other language I was talking about with the uh, clearance levels, et cetera. Then in the lower part there is their ceiling value for a 10 year period. And you also see who it's supporting, which is everybody, 
entire government. Um, so HHS presumably could come to DISA and say, we want to use our funds to do this. Um, you know, you're better at this than we are, so we want you to buy it, et cetera. Whereas when we get to the next um, slide, which is their Encore program, and they explain that this is their really big premier contract. First, we've got the bluff, and it's essentially the full spectrum of services, which is uh, a hell of a task to take on when you're talking about the uh, entire U.S. government. Because when you go down to what it supports, we've got DOD, federal agencies, and the IC, the intelligence community, and the intelligence community is, is uh, First of all, I'm going to work for top secret. I think that's the, uh, the main characteristic there in terms of whether they're a serious market, uh, but also they're very particular in what they want to buy and why and deliveries and scope of, of what they want to get um, to, to use for whatever their particular mission is. Um, so again, it's a 10 year ordering period Pull and open the large that 10 years and the smalls have uh, uh, 10 years. Now, this particular uh, blurb on Encore 3 said they may utilize LPTA. Uh, I would be surprised if they do that very often because LPTA is now is a so called disfavored uh, procurement method. So, virtually, and, and all that comes under. Part 15 for negotiations. Uh, it's essentially a, a low and go, and I don't believe that you'll be seeing all that. Now, that's just my opinion, but I, I mentioned that so that people who see something under Encore 3 uh, will, will take heart that the explanation may refer to LPCA, but it's not going to necessarily mean they will use it. And then the, on the next slide is their last uh, so-called premier uh, contract. And you'll notice this is the DITCO Systems Engineering Technology Innovation, where the other ones have been uh, DISA. Uh, the difference is zero. I don't seem to, did not see any reason to think that DITCO versus DISA made any difference with respect to their contract methods or whatever, but DITCO and, and this, I, I think, are the same, one and the same when it comes to the procurement world. Uh, but this one, under their support, is DOD Mission Partners, which would uh, that, that presumably focus on the, the military departments, Coast Guard, uh, basically someone with some type of uh, uh, offensive or combat capability. And again, they mentioned LPTA, um, and we have the <clears throat> ordering period there. Uh, again, another 10 years, and then 7.5 billion is, is uh, better than, than nothing. And then uh, I give the website where I got all this information from on these three. Uh, and now we turn to the, to the next slide, and it tells you all the other vehicles they use. There's a lot of GSA involvement down there. Everybody's heard of Oasis and Stars 3, et cetera. Um, the reason I mention that is because if uh, your company is just starting out or has a very peculiar uh, specialty in terms of the IT world, then it may be that DISA is buying something through the GSA schedule. So BitGo is buying something through the GSA schedule. So that would be two things uh, that you would confirm is that something you sell is on the schedule and you may be on the schedule already. And then since this uh, support um, contract 
for a support effort, uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't go to uh, Scott Air Force Base in Market. He would go to <clears throat> an Army or an Air Force Base and uh, a, a Navy facility and say, "This is what you guys need. Let's try to get it away. Let's try to buy it under the uh, working capital fund." And of course, I'll give you a two point two five percent off. So now we get to the regulations starting on the next slide. And we've got the FAR, the DFAR, and the DARS. DARS is the DISA supplement. Now this is three layers of regulation for what I think is the best value approach that DITCO and DISA are going to take on behalf of purchases they make for themselves or they make for, <clears throat> uh, for other agencies. Now you can you can get the DISA or the DARS, the DFARS and the FAR, of course, all from acquisition.gov. So that's down there at the bottom. And then you can get the other the other general information from the DPAP or the DPC website. To my knowledge, the defense policy and procurement people changed their name to defense pricing contract in a year or two ago or two, two or three years ago. And then uh, they haven't gotten around to changing their, their website because people like myself still refer to them as DPAP. So now on the next slide, I go into an explanation of the DARS. And it seems pretty clear that the best way to describe how the DAR supplements the FAR in the DFARS is to explain what it does not have any language on. If you went to part 14 of the DARS, it would say no text. Same with emergency acquisitions, foreign acquisitions, other social and economic programs, which is uh, usually by Indian app or that sort, uh, cost accounting standards and cost principles. I think any experienced contractor is well aware that we've got a lot of guidance on that and don't need a, a supplement from uh, DISA to assist on that. Uh, it's a little surprising to me that R&D contracting part 35 and the uh, federal supply contracting part 38 also had no text, but under, under the DARS, there is some information related to the schedule in part eight, which is sort of where it shows up the FAR and the DFAR. And then since R&D contracting can be a big part of, uh, of the the DITCO purchases. I was just a little surprised at that. And then part 52, there's nothing there either. And that was very surprising. And I'll explain that, or excuse me, I'll address that uh, in, in a few minutes because I can't explain it. Okay, so we go on to two things I noticed on the next slide. I noticed that the Part 10 market research. This is, again, where I think this small business office is doing something a little bit more. It says that the estimated value exceeds 5 million, then the market research and whatever document you're going to have to explain to small business people is, is essentially going to say when, when we uh, when we, the buyer, are going to buy this, small business wants to make sure that the that, that potential sources, quote unquote, are not requested to submit the minimum information necessary. Now, the FAR says the, uh, the, it's the, the admonition is make sure that you don't ask for more information than necessary. Uh, same with the DFAR. Uh, but this is the only agency that I could find, and I, I checked real quick, 
law where it says if it's over five mil, it's going through Office of Small Business first. And the site there is a DARS 10.001E. And then on part 27, it seems that uh, DISA was, was rather proud of this, but they are the only uh, agency I've seen that covers trademarks. Occasionally, an agency will just use a trademark. There was a recent Court of Federal Claims case on it. And, and, you know, court, like you might imagine, in the absence of any authority, of course, you know, what are you doing for me? And can't do it. But this uh, is reserving a right to use a trademark or service mark if it was created under a contract. I can't think of any examples uh, offhand that would try to make that uh, useful, but it is something to keep in mind that they pay enough attention to their intellectual property to carve out that particular uh, element of uh, trademarks because the patents, data, and copyright, you know, or at least on data and copyright and in, in the FAR patents, we've got, we've got a lot of guidance on that already. So again, when we go to the next page, we get into the uh, DISA instructions. We're going to do instructions here and then we do circulars on the next slide. But here on the instructions, uh, there's under that link, there's 57 DISA instructions. And you can see the time frame, the time breadth that they've done, that they've issued instructions on. And not many of them have to do with what I would call procurement related uh, issues. So I stressed a little bit, you know, we have an instruction on alternative the speed resolution, we have an instruction on uh, sensitive, un releasing sensitive unclassified information, which we would now call CUI. Um, program protection is, is the same thing, which is you know, keeping a mum, mum word on what, what you're doing. Uh, life cycle sustainment, systems engineering, uh, applies for AT acquisition. Intuitive, we see that those have some uh, procurement related uh, issues and, and whether or not to uh, do anything, excuse me, to look at this information during the uh, proposal planning stage or marketing stage. And then we go to the, the next slide, we have the circulars. And the circulars is, as near as I can tell, just something for purposes of internal management. Uh, so in comparison to an Air Force circular or an Army circular, uh, where there's definite categories of circulars, in, including a procurement, uh, specifically a procurement, this doesn't seem to have this. So I was trying to think of a way to make these relevant for purposes of this presentation. And I came up with two <clears throat> of the, uh, <clears throat> me, two of the circulars they have. Uh, if you've got something with the uh, uh, spectrum management, if that's, if that's what your proposal may be about, it may be worthwhile to look at, look at the uh, circular and see if there's anything in there that will give you information for a proposal or to uh, to draft a question uh, for, for Q&A. And I mentioned the one on the, uh, <clears throat> the gig, the global information group, because the DOD gig is a very big part of DOD's information technology thinking. And this one deals with technical control. So again, if you're doing something with one of DOD's big, big programs uh, through this, then this uh, that circular uh, may be may be useful for you. Okay, so now turning to the next slide, we get into the uh, information 
related to DARS in particular. And, and this is where I have got frustrated. DARS 15.300 paren S90, I've quoted, and it quotes, it refers to the DISA procurement contracting procedures, guides, and templates web page. Okay. That's a great idea, except I can't find it uh, anywhere in any method on the internet. So when you're uh, dealing with, with this, uh, I think you should write them and say, your DAR says this is 15.300. Can you send me a copy or give me a working link? Uh, then we have the OSD guide to collection and use of past performance information. That's a Google search, you can get that. The next one, DOD source selection procedures. Again, the same thing. In fact, you can get that at, at the DPAP. And it's got this source selection procedure, which I cannot find. Okay, um, I just, just want to let you know that's about all I can do with that. But this does have some other guidance. Uh, first, the one this November 2013 one entitled Proactively Tailored Acquisition Models to Guide BISA's Acquisition of IT Products and Services. <clears throat> That's a mouthful, and the guidance is about 170 pages. And then this BISA terms and conditions to all service level agreements, um, which you can see has been revised 19 times. And uh, this latest is dated 2018. Um, that is also available. You can get that with the, with the Google search, but that's one I would definitely become familiar with if the if a service level agreement is, is a part of what your proposal is, because then you will know what exactly this is looking for and as you can see uh, that is something in what all the uh, DOD and agency mission part so that's computing services enterprise application identity uh, access you know, cyber compliance and uh, global content delivery which is which is uh, a focus on the on the DISN or the uh, the information network, DOD information network. Uh, now, uh, the last, excuse me, close to the last slide. Uh, this is something on acquisition vehicles. Uh, first of all, OTAs, people may hear about the other transaction authority agreements uh, for years. And, this text here, except for the typo I made, uh, which we'll get to, is uh, pretty much right out of DOD's guidance. So you, if you were to go to uh, the DPAP site, which which you know, the, the defense pricing contract site is what you have in this elsewhere in here, you can get a copy of DOD's uh, 2018 guidance on OTAs. And I've got the two types, and, and unfortunately, the number one, the number two, they read the same. Um, number one should read advanced research projects or prototypes. That's, that's the difference between those two statutory sites. And then this is the general conditions for use. And what, what I'm not getting into here is uh, the consortium approach uh, to these OTAs versus you know, small business one-off uh, type of thing. They're being used uh, quite a bit. I did look at a DODIG report on the use of, uh, of OTAs. Uh, as you can imagine, the IG had something to criticize about 33 of the 35 they looked at or something like that. But what was striking in there is the dollar volumes of OTAs have gone up considerably in the, in the last uh, six or seven years. Uh, so there is 
obviously a lot of benefit to getting on a on OTA team on o, or getting involved with OTA sourcing. Uh, one thing you want to ask at that first meeting is, uh, are you funded or how much of a chance you have of getting funded? Because a funded OTA and a non-funded OTA are uh, it's a big difference, as, as you might, might imagine. So now the next slide shows a new, relatively new acquisition vehicle that I'm predicting DISA and DITCO will use a lot. This uh, commercial solution opening has uh, gotten a lot of press recently. As you can see there, I've got a, a sort of a bottom right-hand side, the uh, uh, February 4 uh, is, is the most recent explanation, not explanation, uh, most recent reference to CSOs by the Defense and Pricing Organization. What, and what they did is they extended it indefinitely. It was a pilot program starting in 2018, and now it's no longer a pilot program. But it is a way to um, get a contract officer to acquire innovative commercial items, et cetera, using a competitive procedure. Uh, that's been designated as a CSO. And there's some, of course, some uh, procedures that the country often has to go through, but it's essentially like a DARPA BAA, as near as I can tell, which, which means it's been funded before it goes in, goes up before it's announced. Uh, and that's significant. This is this is how you get to it in the, in the next slide. Um, is what's it? Is, on, I have to try and get to the next slide. There, and that's basically if uh, since OTAs and CSOs seem to be identical in purpose, what's the difference between the two? Well, it's Right there. Um, one's an agreement, and the other one is a method. And then what's similar is that the agreement and the method may merge, or well, I shouldn't say merge, uh, may be the same uh, with respect to uh, the end result for the contract, which is to say uh, they may use a uh, non-FAR based solicitation method to get a legally binding procurement agreement, except for what we call an OTA. I was somewhat fascinated by this. So I looked around and the uh, DIUX, which is uh, Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, um, had a little how to guide. And this is where the only, you know, I don't want to say only, but one, one of the best explanations of CSOs, even though it's uh, 2016, that is before the uh, pilot program even began, uh, gives you an idea what, what CSOs do and uh, what you can do, what you can suggest to a uh, buyer in the military departments who is then going to get their money from, excuse me, they're going, to, they're going to have money that they're going to give to DISA. And I wouldn't call it orchestrating, but I would say, certainly say, I would suggest you look at this CSO because we have a commercial solution that only has to be tweaked a bit and, and maybe not by, maybe interface will be by, by the government. The point being is there's, there's a easier way to do it essentially in the IT world than there is for anything else. How that would work out, I don't know. I don't have any experience with that, but it does seem to be the uh, type of vehicle that this would want to 
uh, employ rather than go through the OTA process. And then the next slide is what we need to wait for, and that is done. So appreciate you listening. What well, was it? David, thanks for the uh, the great information, uh, and thanks to everybody who joined us today. The slides will be available later this afternoon. We'll have the recording up on our YouTube channel, uh, as well as our website later today. And don't forget to join us on Friday when we cover the DISA playbook, when we'll be talking about uh, contract opportunities, contracting trends, uh, mergers and acquisitions within the top contractors at DISA. Uh, and other important facts and information for any marketing, sales, and business development efforts uh, at DISA, uh, which I think actually David covered with some of the scorecard information and, um, and so thanks again, everybody. Uh, and we hope to see everybody then on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.